Welcome back to The Musicologist and the Nerd. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Concord, and this is Nicholas Atchison Wainwright III. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so, Nick, how have you been? Oh, doing pretty well. You know, self-isolation does me good. Yes, but you're still working full-time, right? Sadly, yes. <laughs> Sadly, yes. Yeah, me too. Um, I have one corner of my house uh nate and i live in kind of a mother-in-law and uh i have one corner where i work i record my podcast and i sew masks and that is my life (laughs) ah such it is and for those that haven't got the clue we're still in quarantine this is covid19 keeping us locked up in our uh bedrooms houses little corners of our rooms at this time but we're making the most of it and we're still here recording we are, and we're still listening to music and watching musicals, and we're really glad that you came back to check out what we're listening to. Yeah, if we haven't scared you off at this point, I think nothing will. <laughs> All 48 of our, no, I guess, what was it? We have, uh, we've had 48 listens so far, and uh, <laughs> you can cut that part out if you want to. Go team, go! We're so popular. And I will say, I think we're on, what are we on, episode seven? Yes. And uh, my husband has listened to six and uh, our mutual friend Liza, I believe, has also listened to six. So 12 out of our 48 listens are two people that know us really well. <laughs> there we go. Yep. There may be a little cat interference here, just FYI. There is a black and white fluffy cat who has come for some loves. I think cat <laughs> interference is the perfect kind of uh, interference for the kind of nerds that we are. That's right. Have you seen that meme going around that dogs are overjoyed that we're home and uh, cats just knew it would happen that eventually our bosses would figure out we were huge losers and fire us? Yep. Yeah. (laughs) It's so true. Anyway. Okay. On to the topic at hand. (laughs) What is the topic at hand? Oh, right. The topic at hand. Yeah. Musicals. Musicals. Yeah, so over this last couple of days, we each listened to and watched a musical that we had never seen. So, yeah, I picked uh, The Greatest Showman because it's one that I know that, Nick, you really like this one. And um, I've been meaning to watch it for, gosh, a year, year and a half. Yeah, I think I've been pressing you on that one for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, yes. I think I told you I'd go to your house and watch it with you and then just failed to do that. Yeah. And then pandemic and, you know, All life that. is busy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You you like got married or something. There I'm was not, that in there kind of threw a wrench uh, in all my something, plans. You know, planning a wedding, working overtime to pay for said wedding, hanging out with your wife. Yeah. Although she was my roommate at the time. So really, it's inexcusable. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, and for my... For my musical, I picked The Last Five Years. Um, it's one that I have one of my seen. Favorites. And yeah, it, we'll, we'll go into that in into a second. So um, big thing, though, is so the good thing about this is we have both seen these musicals that the other person had not before. So she hadn't yes. seen The Greatest Showman. I, I know it very well. She knew, knows uh, The Last Five Years really well. I had never seen it. So we're able to uh, scrutinize each other well at this point. So yes. I think I'm going to take the lead. I'm going to start off with uh, the last five years. And this is something okay. that I had attempted to watch once. And I got maybe five minutes in and I'm like, mm, I'm done. <laughs> so <laughs> my wife and I sat down yesterday and we watched it, which for me to sit down for a whole two hours and watch a movie I'm like a squirrel on crack. I don't just sit still very well. So I... <laughs> I I'm trying I not to laugh. I'm sorry. If you guys could see Nick's tool shed, you would know that he has tried at one point to do some, any type of woodworking and putting, building his own items, fixing things, lawn care. I mean, he, he literally, he can't sit still. Yeah. Yeah. But it's okay. I got, I got only a few hobbies. Um, so... <laughs> I sat down and I watched this movie and immediately the pace is awful. It is so slow. Now, I will say 
It stars Anna Kendrick and Jeremy Jordan, two amazing singers, amazing actors. And so good. If, if that's all I judge it off of is like, this would be an amazing movie. I'm so happy to see it. And Anna Kendrick's part is just so downtrodden and slow and she never gets to belt it. Doesn't have this happy, joyous, you know, she's got that big smile and during the whole movie, every time you see it, it's a sad smile. Yeah, it is. And so, okay, quick premise, probably some uh, spoilers here. The movie is non-sequential, starts at the end of their relationship. She's sitting alone in a room crying about how it's all done. And it's a kind of good song. It's not a bad song. It's and my favorite song in the whole it's, show. It's definitely the best song in the show, which is saying something for it being an okay song. <laughs> and then the movie goes and it goes back to the beginning and somewhere in the middle, back and forth, it splits all over the place. Kind of hard to keep track of time. You eventually figure it out as they go. But there, it, it starts at the end and you know this relationship is not going to work out. So there's really no hope throughout the whole movie. And the only thing you learn during the movie, the only progression that happens is, so it goes from right at the end to right at the beginning where they first like hook up and become a couple. And the only th thing you learn from that point on is how much of a jerk he becomes when fame and money come into the question. That's the only progression in the whole movie. Oh, this guy's actually an asshole. Libby, yep. do you disagree? I don't. No. I completely agree. I don't think that there was anything of value that this movie brought to my life. It's, that uh, is a strong statement, sir. <laughs> it has a lot of okay songs. Jeremy Jordan has a couple of really more powerful songs. He has the more powerful role and... Uh, it's great hearing him sing, but nothing can I think of. Like, I can't think of any of the songs walking away from that. Can't hum a tune. Can't think of the lyrics. Nothing. Wow. That's intense. I sing these songs all the time. They're totally stuck in my head constantly. <laughs> yeah. No, just it's. And now I'm a huge music nerd. There's seldom do I come across something where I don't find something good about it. Like I've. You know, like I said, I've, you know, I've been going through hip hop lately. I go through, you know, Spanish music. I go through, I, there's, I could find merit in most any music. And I'm not saying this is bad, but this is just so mediocre that it's forgettable. <laughs> well, I have a proposition for you, Nick. I okay. think that when, um, when this whole pandemic is over and everyone can travel again and the Broadway troops are traveling, should this one come to Seattle, we will make a point to go to that really great Jamaican restaurant in Soto. Was oh, that where oh, did the, we go last time? The, the Caribbean restaurant, Paseo. The oh, Caribbean. Yes. That's what it was. Oh, so good. We'll make a point to go there and we will go see this on stage. You know, I don't think I'd want to waste my money on it. Well, the reason that I think we should do that, I know, and maybe it'll be our treat um we can we can do another couple's date down there is because i've read a couple of reviews of the movie and i thought this one from rolling stone was really good um and it here i'll just read i'll read you part of it so um the person who watched it said that um this combination um the the musical about a failed five-year marriage worked like a charm when i saw it off broadway in 2002 um, with the stellar Sherry Renee Scott and Norbert Leo Butts singing their broken hearts out. Uh, the score was fantastic. I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, the CD is a deserved cult item, but what works on stage becomes a dodgier situation when you put those two star-crossed lovers on camera in a near deserted New York. How do you reach lyrical heights when film grounds you to reality? Um... Yeah, and that was that was what I saw in a lot of the reviews. Is that on stage? This is really compelling. Um, it's a really raw emotional show that actually seems to have a point, but as soon as you put it into movie form, it just kind of um, 
not makes it clinical, but it, it takes away a lot of the feeling, even though, as you said, these are amazing performers. Okay, I, I'll give you that. Maybe I'll even look up some of the music from the stage show. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a hard sell to get me to spend hard earned money on this show after watching that movie. <laughs> when I know there's so many great stage shows out there that come through Seattle. That's true. We have a ton and uh, we had tentative plans to go to a couple. There were a couple we wanted to drag our spouses to um, right during this time. But, you know, the, the nature had other plans. Uh, well, this review is really cool. I thought that the way that it ended kind of summed up the movie really well. It's easy to overlook the failings in the last five years. Let it in and it knocks you back on your heels, just like love. And that's kind of how I feel about this movie is that it's you, you do spend most of the movie going, you know, guys, you could just get divorced. <laughs> like, you probably should have just broken up instead of gotten married. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, OK, he's a jerk. Got it. There's jerks out there. I don't think we need to focus this movie on it. You're done. And it could have been oh, Goodbye. the last 12 months. OK. <laughs> or the last five months. Why didn't why don't we just shorten it even more? Yeah. You want to get married? Well, I don't know. Mm, probably not what a good idea. Think? Yeah, probably probably not a fantastic idea. Um, well, what did you think of some of the songs? I know that you said that you didn't walk out with any totally stuck in your head. Um, but one of the, the songs in this we talked about last week in a mashup with a piece from Cinderella. Um, yes. I think they called it The Last Ten Minutes Ago. Yes. And when, when that song uh, came on ten minutes ago, I recognized it because of that, and it was completely flat to me. the The song oh, wow. didn't hold anything on its own. That that mashup that we had uh, talked about last week, I love it, and it it's compelling, and it it really holds its own there. And while the song definitely tells a story, it just falls falls dead. Huh. That's interesting. I love this song. I love it in the show. I love it independently. Um, what about Goodbye Until Tomorrow, I Could Never Rescue You, the very last song? Do you remember that one? Nope. Can't even Can't even recall. Nope. Oh, my gosh. It's so funny going through this musical. Um, I mean, like I said on the last podcast, I came into contact with it when I was probably about 19, maybe 20. And at that point, I was like, oh, yeah, well, you know, if you – you really love somebody like you have to have to try to make it work and you know all this stuff and and now that i'm 15 years older i'm like you know she could have just walked away at any point and made beautiful happy music with somebody else <laughs> yeah yeah so okay i pulled up i pulled up the list here and you know it's bad when you actually have to have a list in front of you of what the songs were because they really didn't stick with you right so still hurting the first one it was very raw very emotional that's probably the best one in the whole the whole um film there so the second song shiska goddess what it basically is jamie the male character is saying you're so amazing because you're not jewish i didn't have to go to jewish school with you and then talks about all the jewish girls he had to date and that's like the basis of his relationship. You're pretty and you're not Jewish. Like that's a really, that's a really not a great way of starting this off. And she just. I really think that she should have, she should have thought about what he was saying there and thought about, you know, does he actually love me for who I am or is he just wanting me to be arm candy? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now that I'm looking through the list. There is one song that I do really like in the movie, and there's one little sequence that I like. It's the Shmuel oh, drum song. Roll. The the Shmuel song. So it's oh. the it's the Christmas themed song. Um so he's in short, he's a writer and he's like she just comes back from where he's like, I gotta tell you this story. I just wrote this great story, and he sings this story about a a um tailor and how he spends all his time you know, doing work, but he never gets to create this dress he really wants. And, um, you know, the clock lights up and talks to him, gives him time, and he does this, and it's the story. And then he relates the tailor to her, who she's been working on a dress, which is super underplayed 
I think that could be a really good subplot there, but, or, you know, obviously right. she likes to design dresses. There's always a, there's always a mannequin in the building with a half a dress, but it's very seldom ever mentioned. So, um, that's the only song that ever kind of points it out. And that song presents a really good story, which has nothing to do with the main, main plot of the story. So you like the subplot more than you like the plot. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, I thought it was a really interesting conceit to um, look at something that has failed, something that doesn't have a happy ending, uh, because so often in fictional items like musicals, so often, you know, you end on the tonic, everyone is singing in unison and everyone is happy and it ends that way. Um, something it's something I really liked about Dear Evan Hansen is that it doesn't necessarily end with happiness. Um, it's more human in a way. But this one I thought was really cool to kind of mash together the two timelines and um, just sort of see how how so much hurt can happen. Um, it would have been nice if it was a bit more something you could actually see yourself going through rather than at every turn being like, why, why are they still together? Why, if he's cheating, hasn't he just broken up with her? Why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with you, like seeing something without a happy ending, you know, Wicked was like that. It doesn't have a happy ending. Um, and like you right. said, Dear Evan Hansen, but those, they have the ups and downs and you, you know, it has you wondering and has you thinking and listening and paying attention. This starts down and just goes down from there. <laughs> Nick, did you like the um, the Boz Lerman version of Romeo and Juliet from 1996 with Leonardo DiCaprio in it? I did. Did you see that? Yes. You, huh? Okay. Interesting. That that was just something that something that uh, I'm not quite sure why, but this show this last five the last five years kind of makes me think of Romeo and Juliet in a lot of ways. Um, I can't exactly put it into words, but, uh, I, I was looking back at that Romeo and Juliet after watching The Greatest Showman, and, um, I, I'll talk more about that later, but I was just, you know, they mentioned in the review that I just read from Rolling Stone, um, that they're two star-crossed lovers, and it seemed like there's kind of, there's sort of been an allusion to Romeo and Juliet, and I keep thinking, except that Romeo and Juliet were like 13. Yeah. <laughs> You know, these people made terrible decisions in their 20, you know, I guess you, you never, you never, you're only as wise as you are, right? And that you go through things, but it just kind of uh, made me think of Romeo and Juliet and how Shakespeare really carried that off. And uh, what was it? He, he put disbelief on hold um, so that you could see that unlikely story happen and think, oh yeah, okay. And then uh, in this one, you get to the end and you think, yeah, they would have broken up so much before <laughs> the <laughs> ending here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I thought, I think this is, this is actually one of my absolute favorite musicals. I, the movie was okay. I find Anna Kendrick a little thin in her soprano. Um, but I think that that's okay based on the age of her character. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that actually is, is a good it's a good character part. Um, but yeah. Have you heard anything else that uh, Jason Robert Brown has written? The man who wrote the music for the show? I don't know. The name doesn't ring a bell. Um, he has done uh, the bridges of Madison County, honeymoon in Vegas, um, songs for a new world parade, urban cowboy, I honestly, I haven't seen any of his other things. But when I started looking him up, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I, I would like to, I would like to watch some of his other items that he's, that he's done. Yeah. So. No, I'm looking at his whole works here. I don't, none of them. So that's. Yeah. Well, maybe that'll have to be one of our things. Maybe we'll have to pick a composer that we didn't really know who's a musical theater composer and listen to some of their stuff and, yeah. and expand our palette. Yeah. Now, listening to what to your opinion on this, I think I have to go and take a look at at the music from the stage show. But like like you said, Anna Kendrick's a little thin, but none of this music was full. It never really like 
the female lead part just was so lacking musically to me. It was just all downtrodden and thin and like, yeah. So I, and I feel yeah, like. Well, and honestly, that might be because of her. Um, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I really do like Anna Kendrick, but um, I was not a big fan of her performance in this movie musically. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's interesting. I'll, I'm going to have to take a look. I'm going to uh, go see if I could find some of the, the pieces from the stage show and, and go from there. Okay. Well, I think that next time we get together, we'll have to check in and you'll have to tell me what you thought of the staged version. And I actually haven't listened to the state, the whole staged version. Um, I just heard still hurting at in a musical review and went and listened to every single version I could find. And that was back in the day where you actually had to buy CDs um, because iTunes was still kind of new and didn't have a lot of versions of things. And I don't even, I think maybe YouTube was brand new uh, in the very early 2000s when this came out. Um, so yeah, I had need to go and listen to some more different versions. Okay. And I'm going to apologize now because I feel like I've just been kind of like this like down here. Nope. Bad, bad. Hate it. Everything's <laughs> bad. Awful. <laughs> That's okay. Get ready for me to do the same to one of your favorite musicals. <laughs> okay. Or your favorite musical movie. I don't know. I, I don't want to over overstate your love for uh, the greatest showman, but. <laughs> okay. So are we, are we done? You have anything else you'd like to add on uh, the last five years? No, I am really glad that you watched it, though. It's like you've been trying to talk me into watching The Greatest Showman. I've been trying to talk you into watching the last five years, and I'm glad you gave it a shot. Okay, excellent. All right, Libby, onward to The so, Greatest. The Greatest Showman. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that don't know, this is the fictionalized story of P.T. Barnum. when he, From the time that he is a young boy to when he's probably in his... I would say late thirties, early forties. Um, and it's supposed to, it's, it's a kind of biopic style and it stars Hugh Jackman as PT Barnum. I mean, what a jam packed show. I, if they do a staged version of this, I will definitely go. They're working. Um, on it. I'm so glad because I really think it is a good show. And, um, what, what I liked about it, I, so I watched it with, with my husband, Nate, and with my brother, William, last night. And I was, while I was doing, while I was watching it, I was folding and ironing the um, ties for different masks. And it's a horribly tedious task. It just takes forever. And it flew by because I was totally absorbed with this show. Um, and that was really nice. And it just, I, you know, we all left kind of humming the songs. And, um, yeah, I thought I thought that it was really great it was really cool to see Zac Efron in a different kind of role uh, Michelle Williams as uh, Charity Barnum P.T. Barnum's wife she was amazing um, I actually didn't recognize her until the end of the show like who she was um, I have no idea who Zendaya is but she played one of the uh, secondary main characters and she was great she's a uh, um, she's I, a popular singer right now that just see people i live in a box i don't listen to the radio anymore like nick is the one who's like hey have you heard this like who's that <laughs> like wow you're totally an old person <laughs> you'll like her i'll send you some of her stuff oh yeah you totally should um yes actually back in the days before nate and i had our own vehicle nick uh would routinely volunteer to um drive us places or or pick things up for us and every time i would get in his car I'd be like oh my gosh what is on your what is on your satellite radio now like <laughs> i need i need to listen to more of this um so for those of you that don't know the greatest showman came out in 2017 and the um the songs are by benj pasek and justin paul who wrote dear evan hansen <laughs> Yay, dear Evan Hansen. Yeah, it's okay, I Yay. guess. It's okay. We we kind of like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, I thought it was a really well-done show. It was diverting. It was engaging. Um, essentially, it, it follows P.T. Barnum as he works a normal job. He absolutely hates it. He feels stifled by it. He's won the heart of this rich 
beautiful girl who he wants to give her the life he thinks she deserves with the mansion and all of this stuff. And um, he ends up buying a curiosities museum and turning it into the first circus. And he convinces all of these people who don't fit in in life, uh, the bearded lady, the tattooed man, dog man, um, colored trapeze artists in a time where, I mean, not that it's great to be to be a person of color right now, um, but in a particular time where it was very bad in the mid 1800s and um, takes them all in and creates this showbiz family. And um, yes, so that was very interesting. But if you actually read the biography of P.T. Burnham, just, or P, it's just don't. totally just yeah. Yeah. Barnum, I, I meant to say P.T. Barnum. Um, it's yeah, it's, this is so far different from what he actually did and who he actually was. Um, it's a, I, it's a yeah. great story. It is not a biography. I was actually just telling one of my coworkers the other day who hadn't seen the movie, like watch it. It's amazing. You'll love the music. It'll be stuck in your head forever. Do not look at the history because it is <laughs> wrong. And as a 19th century specialist, <laughs> in particularly um, American and Canadian musicals and this type of traveling show, I, mm, <laughs> yes. All right, let, let, us, let us have it, Libby. Uh, just there were so many things. There were so many things. First of all, it got his life completely out of order. Jenny Lind, too. The fact that the, the idea that there could be any type of romance between them was just awful. They were not at all the same age, um, as far as I remember. I'm double checking my facts here, but I'm pretty sure that they, and she was, Jenny Lind was this really interesting woman. Do you know very much about her, Nick? I, I don't. I know she was, yeah, um, the, that they called her songbird, something like that. The she, Swedish Nightingale. That was, that's yeah, the one. So I, yeah, I guess they were only 10 years apart, actually. They weren't as far apart as I thought. But um, Barnum was this big, flashy guy. And he actually, he he really revolutionized the way that performances happened. He um, was the person who came up with the matinee so that women and children could come. I mean, there, there had been other forms of like afternoon concerts, but he's the one who really kind of got it going in America. And he, he was not afraid to just flat out lie and, um, you know, tell you that this was George Washington's nurse. She was this 161 year old African American woman, <laughs> um, you know, that he was going to put on display and all of this stuff. And um, he was a sensationalist. Whereas Jenny Lind, she didn't wear makeup. She was very um, chaste. She was very reserved. Uh, she decided to retire from being this very famous opera singer at 29 because she just felt like she needed to devote her life to something that meant more. And almost all the money she made, she gave to charity. And she and Barnum, from what I've read, were kind of like oil and water. And she was horrified that he was promoting her so much it was she was very kind of puritan and the idea that he was he was sort of prostituting her image just horrified her um so yeah anyway i just i found that that was really interesting and um i i kind of i've, I've been waiting for you to call me a hypocrite because of how much <laughs> i like hamilton <laughs> When you know Hamilton's this the same way though Hamilton is like it's a little more true to history, but it's not it's not spot on. It's pretty far still. Do you want to know what I like about Hamilton that was not present in The Greatest Showman? All right, hit me with it. A couple of things. First of all, I think that Lin Manuel Miranda did a great job of incorporating period instruments like the harpsichord into Hamilton to still sort of ground you in that musical world. Mm -hmm. And I think that he used enough of Hamilton's actual language or things that were really said that it rings true in a way. Um, 
he, as we've discussed in another podcast, he definitely took some some leaps and um, made some changes to make the story flow better, make it a little more sensationalized. But um, uh, yeah, I felt like The Greatest Showman, it actually kind of reminded me of some of the musicals that used to happen where they'd go, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein, or probably even before their time, Cole Porter, he's an awesome composer. We should put together 10 of his best songs and make a musical. <laughs> And even though this one has a real concrete storyline, it was very predictable, and it just sort of seemed like they thought, okay, who can we get together that are great performers, and we'll put together some good music, and sure, that's a show, great. Well, and it just felt kind of cheap. That Well, that's what it was. It was a sensational show. It was all about mm-hmm. the show. It wasn't about this, you know, it was, they had the story, it was kind of, it was a solid story it wasn't a bad story it wasn't a new story it wasn't anything amazing but it was a solid storyline um you know all generally worked out it had its ups and downs but man it was a show the numbers in it the singing in it the people the acts and um if this thing ever makes it to broadway or to travel like they plan on it's gonna be a hell of a show heck yeah it'll be amazing um it'll be so good Hey, did you know that there is also a 1980 musical called Barnum? I did not. I've never heard of such a thing. No. Yes. I just discovered it today. And um, it's really interesting. It's actually touring right now. Hmm. And so I went online and listened to one of the promos for the company that's doing it. Um, one of the companies that's doing it and uh, it it honestly it doesn't it doesn't sound like that great of a show like it's it's fine but it's not like a Chicago or a you know something mm-hmm. that really sticks with you but I'm gonna try to see if I can find a full-length version of it because I think that'll be interesting and that one is slightly more true to Barnum's life but still has the same uh, idea that Jenny Lind and and uh, Barnum had some type of relationship or almost did and um that's a big focus of it and um yeah it's just interesting i think that that the i don't and it's mainly the plot that bothers me in the show but i felt like the music was amazing it was fantastic and huge and it makes you just want to jump up and dance and sing and um it was just it was just fantastic so i loved the music so here's Here's what I think of it, and I'm sorry, I keep hitting my microphone somehow. I'm not quite sure where I'm hitting that. But, um, You're just trying to get our attention. That's that's, that's exactly it. So <laughs> I, I see this show as the way they would have viewed the circus back when the circus first came or was first invented by Barnum there because it was run down. It was, you know, it was, you know, an old tent. It wasn't anything amazing they had clowns they had you know it was dirt grounded but it was something they had never seen before it was something amazing so nowadays we think of the circus and it's you know the old kind of grimy and you know it's like oh that's kind of cool but there's nothing like crazy amazing but back then it was so now they just took everything that they took the feel of what it was like then and they they kind of made the movie like that at least that's my and opinion. There is something to be said for that. That's actually why um, that is why I thought of Romeo and Juliet, because they kind of tried to take Bos Lerman tried to take this old story and make it contemporary, you know, contemporary music, uh, costumes, settings, um, you know, guns instead of swords, like really. Um, yeah, tried to tried to bring it into the 20th century. Um, and I kind of felt like this was doing the same. Like if, if P.T. Barnum was performing now, this is the, you know, it'd be a Cirque du Soleil sort of situation with this newer music like this, rather than trying to have any truth to what the music of the time would have sounded like. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's, it's bringing to life the feel. It's making it more, you know, exciting now. You know, they tried to make it period, but they failed really, really bad like that. <laughs> they did. They did. It felt like the other thing that I, I kind of didn't like about it is it felt like they were trying to do from the camera angles, from the uh, the way that they choreographed the dance numbers. It felt like they were trying to 
make a stage musical, but just on screen. And somehow that just didn't work for me. I don't know. But what I will say is go out and buy this soundtrack. Even if you don't watch the movie, buy the soundtrack. Go on YouTube. Check out our last podcast episode because there are some good recommendations on there for songs from this musical that have been redone by other people. Um, the, the music is just amazing. It's absolutely great, great singers through there. And Hugh Jackman as a singer is always amazing. Something you'd never think of, you know, singing Wolverine, but he uh, <laughs> he holds his own. Wouldn't that have been funny? I'm surprised nobody has tried to green screen that in. Like him, not as P.T. Barnum, but actually as Wolverine. <laughs> Give me an hour on YouTube. I'll find it for you. Uh, yes. Oh, man, that reminds me of something else I wanted to say about the music, actually. Um something else that kind of bothered me about the music which i would give the music an a plus i really would but many of the songs started off with um with hugh jackman pt barnum almost speak singing in a really really low voice so uh in musicology that one way to refer to that is sprechstemma it's really just you know speak singing speech singing of course sprechstemma yeah that's that naturally of course you know yeah uh, obviously um, <laughs> so there's, there's almost, there are almost moments of that. And what I found was interesting is I didn't think that they mastered it very well. So it's very hard to hear what he's saying. And I think the effect that they were going for is to start literally at the lowest point, the bottom, you are just barely singing, but really you're speaking tunefully in a low chest register, very softly. And then the song just builds and builds and builds and explodes. And I think in that respect, it's kind of a, a um, good technique, but it made it really hard to hear. And they begin the movie that way. They end the movie that way. And it, um, I don't know. It's a technique I didn't like. <laughs> yeah. And there's several of the songs that start like that. Start right at I the can bottom. I think of at least three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the list right now. Uh, the greatest show, I think, a million dreams from now on. They uh, they all start just like this. The uh, the other side starts with a small conversation and explodes. And yeah. So there was one time where I thought there are a couple times where I thought it was really effective, like at the end when he's reconciling with his wife and he is so emotional that he can't sing. You know, he he's just he's actually it kind of it kind of makes it it's it's that moment where you realize that every time he's singing he's putting on a performance he's putting on a show and and that technique of of speaking those words rather than singing them does make them more emotional um it just it it uh it took me out of it for a minute cuz i couldn't quite i have, i have really good hearing and i couldn't quite hear or understand what he said every time and um yeah that bothered me but it was really effective in the emotional moments yeah it it Suckered you in though, though, didn't it? It did. See, it's just for me. It's just like the last five years when you let it in, <laughs> it knocks you back, and you just love it. It's it's um it's kind of a guilty pre pleasure show, you know. Okay, I'm gonna take your word for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you just like it flat out. It doesn't have to be a guilty pleasure. <laughs> yeah, but no, I I totally understand. And like I said, with this with this, it is an amazing show. Just never look at the history. I mean, study P.T. Barnum all you want. This just isn't him. Um, I actually kind of want to read his biography now. I've, it, yeah, I've looked he, into it. He wrote it an autobiography. I, I saw that. I saw that he wrote that. Um, I wonder if it's a sensationalized as this show. Yeah, well, apparently some of the critics at the time just totally panned it. They said it was uh, sensationalist. It was inflammatory. It went, But I mean, that makes it sound kind of interesting. Yeah. And then you have to read, you know, a biography to even it out. Right. Because right. if you're totally. reading the autobiography of a guy that's known to flat out lie, there's going to be some, you know, some interesting points given. Yeah, I think so, too. Oh, man. Well, so, Nick, what have you been listening to this week besides your most favorite musical ever the last five years? <laughs> so this uh, this week has been more of me messing around with my music making skills. So I've been listening to um, a fair bit of kind of upbeat, poppy, dancey music. Um, 
a bit as I cruise around, but I've been listening to Dolly Parton's Jolene on repeat over and over and over again. Um, and that has to do with, uh, she, that song is simple enough and in a range that I can sing it and I'm a bass, but I could sing it decently ish. Well, which is not, wasn't really the point. The point is to record and sing multiple layers and mix them. I'm working on my mixing skills. I'm not an expert by any means, but I want to become better. So by being able to record that, it gave me a chance to see how well I could fix it. And it's been a, it's been a fun process. Um, and then well, and what made you choose that particular song? I mean, other than, other than that, it's a fairly basic song. Um, are you a Dolly Parton fan? Was this just kind of you two brought this up and you were like, yeah, I'm going to go for it. Um, actually it's just, uh, my wife and I, uh, Elizabeth and I will sit down sometimes in the evening, pick up ukuleles and just kind of pluck away. And I just got her onto playing her own. So I'll play some, she'll play some. And we're just kind of messing around, finding songs that are within our ability Jolene's a super easy one to play. So it's on my bookmarks. We both can play it. And as I'm playing it, I'm like this one, you know, as well as, you know, a few like Hawaiian style songs, I could actually play and sing this song. So I figured, hey, why not? And I kind of went from there. Well, I liked your recording. I thought it was great. And uh, eventually I'm going to figure out what it is that also uses exactly the same first four chords and the way that you so nick sent me the track of him singing with the ukulele and then also the ukulele track and the first the first chords in the ukulele track it reminds me of something else and i can't think of what it is but it sounds so familiar and when i figure it out i'm going to tell you um i'll tell you i do I've that i've never heard jolene oh, though i like it i I'm, I'm surprised i'm going to send you a couple versions um that are amazing there but it's i do that all the time i'll just pick up my ukulele and i'll like pluck on things just absentmindedly i'm like i know what is that and then i'll spend the next 10 15 minutes uh just looking around and uh, last time i did it i'm like i plucked three strings ding ding i'm like oh what is that and it just hit me i i just knew the song and i knew it was a classic rock song i could not figure out who it was i'm thinking it's not rolling stones i'm going through i'm going through like all the like famous classic rock songs like okay not aerosmith not, and it took me a solid 45 minutes to figure out that it was the opening uh opening notes to stairway to heaven by led zeppelin oh my gosh it's only one of the most famous songs of all time yeah it's right fine. like yeah just like everybody will know those four notes but it took me that long to figure out what i was playing well i've really been enjoying how creative you've been i've i've been funneling so much of my energy into sewing masks um that i haven't I haven't really had the time. I am a really big knitter. I haven't even necessarily had the time to do that. Um, but I thought that I would have a lot of time to write or to, you know, do other creative things. And I haven't. And every time Nick sends me something, I'm like, oh, this is so great. And then I just, I've probably spent the last three hours before we got together listening to Jolene on repeat. <laughs> yeah. It's weird what things take over our lives when we have time. And I don't have time, but the fact that I can't go out and do other projects uh, just kind of helped me to be able to sit in and work on things that have suddenly become like things I really want to do. Well, I think that's really cool. I've been really enjoying it. Hopefully we'll be able to share some things with you guys at some point. We may try to do um, a mashup. I might try to sing it along with Nick's uke. And uh, it'll be an absolute amateur effort, uh, but we we <laughs> have fun. So that's the important part. <laughs> yes. Okay. And speaking of amateur effort, I have something else I want to tell you. But first, what have you been listening to? Oh, um, I'm excited. Uh, so sort of randomly, I, I, I know why it came up, but it seemed random to me. I've been listening to a lot of Jeremy Jordan on YouTube. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't listened to a lot of his stuff, but he's such a good singer. Like, awesome. I, I, I like... really love him. Now, I, I didn't even really know who he was about a week before now, even though he was, he was in the last five years. And I just was like, oh, yeah, some, you know, he's fine, whatever. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think it's because I had started re-listening to the last five years when you picked which musical you were going to listen to. And so YouTube was like, oh, you like that? Well, you're going to like Jeremy Jordan. Yeah, he's he's a powerful, strong singer. And then I've seen a lot of his performances on YouTube. And he's, you know, got people cracking up. He's, you know, charismatic. He's, he has a good show. He does a great job. He yeah. really does have a great show. Um, I highly recommend that everybody go watch his performance of Celine Dion's It's All Coming Back to Me Now. I, I was just going to say that one. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. I probably listened to it six times. So, um, you know, we've all kind of been stuck at home. And so sometimes my brother will come in and, and hang out and sit in here. Uh, during the day and I will just turn that on repeat and sing it over and over and over while I am typing things into our invoice processing software and after a while he's like okay I have to go I can't hear that song anymore <laughs> <laughs> that's that's pretty good also I do that all the time to my wife <laughs> fairly regular it's, basis it's great to live with other people and have uh your oddities either make them happy or drive them insane or both <laughs> Or both at the same time. Anyway, what were you going to tell me? Okay, no, I'm not. I don't think I told you last week, but um, I've been studying hip hop a lot. Did I tell you about this? Uh, I think you said you'd been listening to it, but okay. didn't tell me any more than that. So I've been listening to it, and I've been trying to break it down into what, how hip hop songs are written, sung, all that type of thing. So I decided I'm going to write a hip hop song. I love it. So <laughs> I, I was st like listening to some like Macklemore or something. And I was talking to one of my coworkers, Kina about this. And she's like, Oh, you should just like pick something really random, like a bug or, you know, something, just something completely random and write a hip hop song around, around that. So I did. Um, I went onto Wikipedia. I hit random article a few times and I came across an article for San Francisco, Minnesota, which is <laughs> a town that existed for like 10 years. Um, and the, the article is like four lines long. So I had to make up a lot of stuff, like a lot, like greatest showman level of making stuff up. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've got it all, all the lyrics written out. I'm currently working on, I got a chorus written out. I got, um, chords. I have to make sure it sounds right compared to the rest of the song. Still, I need to come up with the beat. I need to finish it. And then at some point I'm going to have to rap um like a lot it's eight pages long on a fairly large font but yeah um and it's quick 120 beats per minute so it's uh it's going to be really interesting hearing the whitest guy you know rap about a city in minnesota that existed for 10 years <gasps> that's so crazy you're gonna be rapping about a ghost town when did it exist from what was its um, time period that's a let's see let's see Hold, please, for Googling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> luckily, it's right in my top search results. <laughs> um, let's see. San Francisco, Minnesota, first settled in 1854. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And then it was still existed last time on a census in 1870. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very short lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it... It was named after San Francisco, California. So I turned this into like a big feud between the two. Um, so. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, how interesting. I wonder if, um, hang on, I'm now Googling. Uh, I don't know if you know the history of the railways, Nick, but I think that was it 1850 that San Francisco was connected to? Uh, hang on. I'm going to find this. So in the 1800s, the, the railway, of course, was being built. Um, two main competing companies. One was building from the West Coast to the East, one from the East to the West. Mm -hmm. And um, I think... Let's see. When was the Golden Spike um, that they were connected right around that time. 1869. 18, okay. 1869 okay. So, is when the Golden say, Spike was laid. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I was a little bit off because uh, there are certain towns that like on Alaska, you know, that I think are named because people were heading to Alaska mm -hmm. and that was one of their stops. Um, but I, I would have been interesting to, interested to see if this one 
had a similar history because people were going to San Francisco through this town. And so they decided to name it San Francisco. <laughs> you know, I, the, the little bit of information that's out there doesn't even say. Yeah, Interesting. I mean, yeah. It says the, Will, the founder, William Foster, named it after the city in California. Oh, I'm pretty excited to hear this this hip hop song of yours. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be awful, but it'll be really interesting, and uh, that's that's been my big project for the week. So, and that's gonna. Well, that's really cool. On. I hope you write us a new theme song at some point because mm-hmm. we have just a the standard YouTube. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, at some point, at some point, that's gonna be the goal. You really don't, you really don't want this this song to be our theme song. This shouldn't be our theme song. I don't know though. I mean, if it's about this cool town, like, oh, I should check to see if any traveling troops that I study went through there, and we could do this entirely awesome music history. We could be the next Lin Manuel Miranda. We could write a whole hip hop musical about San Francisco, Minnesota. <sighs> <laughs> I'll I'll forward you uh, I'll forward you what I got, but it's oh I'm so excited. <laughs> Sorry, all the rest of you don't get to hear yet. <laughs> so someday you guys will actually hear me sing, and I'll let you know. Um, I I sent it to Libby and of the me singing Jolene. And while it does work with my range, I found that I don't sing with the confidence of a good singer. So you could hear the warble in my voice of like, I'm not sure if I really want to project this out. And for like 100 percent, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm not a great singer. Like I I could use some training for for her solid there. So it's someday you'll hear me sing. Today's not that day. <laughs> I thought it was great, and I think that this is a that Jolene is a slightly tricky song in that the phrases don't start on the chord changes, and um, so that makes it a little bit difficult. You you're definitely right. You have to know where you're going because the uh, accompaniment and your uke was fairly sparse in its accompaniment uh, is not going to lead you there. <laughs> no, I, actually, when I was recording it, I as most of the time you do record the instrument and the uh, vocal separate. Um, the, the chord changes are on in the middle of a word. So in the word Jolene, the chord changes on the L Jolene is where you're going to find the emphasis and the chord change. So um, I had to be watching my screen for that spike every time uh, the, the instrument was strummed for when I was emphasizing uh, or how I was hitting it. So it was interesting. It took several takes to actually get it down to even somewhat presentable. Um, but when you get it down, it's better. And Libby has more of a challenge because she doesn't have her the software I do staring to stare at the computer. Yeah, no, I, I it's a little it's a little bit different. It's hard to start at the right time, um, for sure. Well, I think that Nick, if you get the chance, I. For those of you that know me, know that I love Canadian music and I love Stan Rogers and the song Down the Road is really awesome. And if you or our friend Kilbert get to cut a track for the accompaniment to Down the Road, this could be a really fun mixing thing that we have going on. It's the uh, social distancing band rehearsal. <laughs> I like it. I, I think we could do this. Uh, we can get a track cut from, you know, miles away. Not terribly, but from some distance, I think we could cut a, a decent little track and maybe we'll share it here. It would be awesome. I think it'd be great. Okay. Yeah, well, I think that's all we've got for this week, right? Okay. And uh, our outro today is me on a really tiny djembe. Okay, let's go. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>